All right, open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Romans, chapter 5. Last week, we looked at extraordinary love. Talked about the love of God is demonstrated. Uh, in, in the context there, we, we looked at, at, at <laughs> some rather uh, unfavorable comments that Paul had about humanity. We're going to talk about that a lot more this morning. He, he said in verse 6 of chapter 5 that we were powerless and ungodly. <laughs> and yet he says in verse 8 that the love of God is demonstrated to us. Not just talked about, but demonstrated to us. How? How was it demonstrated? He says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died. And then in verse 10, he says, while we were enemies, we were reconciled through his death. And now we have available to us a life that is no longer powerless, but that we have been, we have the opportunity to be empowered by the working of the Holy Spirit to live the resurrection life. We're going to look at that more next week. In chapter 6, in verse 4, he says, Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So part of what Paul is doing here at the last half of chapter 5 is he's setting up uh, some wonderful teaching that he's going to do in chapter 6. So in being faithful to his word, we're going to get into it this morning. We're looking at some weighty theological issues this morning. Uh, I was thinking about this, guys. You know, some prefer kind of a light, uh, surfacey, feel-good message. Uh, and there are times, I mean, as we go through God's Word, we, we look at the, the tough stuff and the, and the good stuff, the sweet stuff, and everything in between. And um, uh, just looking at, and, and, and in my own heart, just holding these things up to the Lord and and just kind of being refreshed in what the church's mission is. Uh, having uh, gone to this pastor's conference a couple of weeks ago and, and seeing and visiting with other pastors that their lives are being pressed in and, and persecution is actually broken out in some of the churches. And, and we haven't faced that directly here, but it's coming. Uh, I, I don't see it getting better. And, and so... Uh, looking at what our mission is, 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 is we're to pour into the culture around us. That's the job of the church. We are here as sort of a, a life-saving station in the midst of a dying world. Uh, we're not to imitate the culture for greater appeal, and I see that happening. And, and it burdens my heart because that's not the church's job. Yeah, we want to be relevant, but not culturally relevant to the point where we're just imitating the culture to make feel, people feel comfortable. It, 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 to me, that just doesn't sit well as being consistent with the mission of the church. Because we want to dig into his word. We want to see how it applies to each of our lives. We want God to speak to us. I was looking at, in John chapter 10, and in verse 27, Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That can't and won't happen with a feel-good or pop psychology type message or, or even a moralistic message as good as understanding that we are to live morally good lives. It's not just about moralism. It's not just about, well, let me pick a scripture and then teach you how not to and then fill in the blank. It's not the job of the gospel. That's not the purpose of the gospel. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that's what we're talking about here in Romans. And the rest will come. That's the order that he's put in place for us. Uh, as we look at this, we, we want to go with what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2 about rightly dividing the word of truth. That's where we're going to hear our master's voice. That's where we're going to have our hearts enlightened and our minds. That's where our lives are going to be transformed on the cutting edge of the Word of God. As that goes forth, and as the Spirit of God takes the Word of God, drives it into the hearts of the people of God, our lives are impacted and changed. So now, in, in Romans 5, we're going to look at verses 12 through the end of the chapter, verse 21. Uh, Paul's going to tell us how it is that in Christ... 
everything has changed. I mean everything. You want to talk about, yeah, I, I love to say there was a book that was written years ago. It talks about the upside down kingdom. That now the principles that drive the kingdom of God, again, it's not about trying to imitate the world. It's about living in a kingdom that has the polar opposite <laughs> principles that drive it as opposed to the world. And, and, and so as we look at this, everything indeed does change in Christ. You can see, as you see by the slide here, that we're looking at two men this morning. Uh, here in Romans 5, Paul's developing some concepts that illustrate the greatness of the work which Jesus accomplished on our behalf. I want to look at three core questions here that, that Paul will address as he goes through this. Uh, the first is, what did Jesus exactly, what was it that he accomplished on the cross? What are the nuts and bolts of the transaction? The second is, what is the nature of the transaction? How did it come about? What is the impact? The third, how is my life affected? How is my life transformed? How is my life benefited through this work? So, uh, He's going to address those things, those questions, by doing a series of contrasts. He's going to talk about what Jesus did, and then he's going to talk about what another man did uh, here in Romans 5. So picking it up in verse 12, he says, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. The first man, obviously, is Adam. He's talking about, he's going all the way back to the creation, talking about Adam. And I want to talk about some assumptions that are being made here, too. Uh, Paul does, this is a settled issue for Paul. He doesn't question whether or not Adam existed. He starts with the knowledge that he did. Uh, he assumes his readers understand that as well. He's not giving a, a, a lengthy uh, exhortation on, look, you need to really realize that this is a real guy. No, he's assuming that. He's also assuming that he's not only real, but that he plays a central role in our understanding of our human condition. And folks, Adam plays a central role in understanding ourselves and, and our place in this world and, and uh, all the things that have to do with the nature that we inherit from him. He assumes also that Adam, that what, what Adam did in the garden, that it was a historic fact. It's not an allegorical story. This isn't fairy tales. You know, people like to, well, Adam and Eve, sort of assuming that that's kind of a nebulous, ethereal kind of a thing. No, he starts with the knowledge that this is real, this is true, Adam impacts our lives in significant ways. And that Adam was a real man in a real garden who really sinned. He had a real effect and impact on the human race down through the ages to this day. So understand that going in. We're talking about, yeah, all the way back to the creation. But we're going to be talking about, and Paul gets into some really kind of some weighty stuff. And if you just read this, I remember the first time I read this section in Romans, I was like, what on earth is he talking about because he does a lot of twists and turns. He does a lot of contrasting here. But let's work through it together. So the question is, what is the impact that Adam had? And, and he, the answer here in verse 12 is, Through one man sin entered the world, and death spread to all men. Not some. All. I think it's interesting, too, just as a side note, that, that Eve was the first one to sin chronologically. She was the first one. She's the one that, that the serpent tempted and that she partook. But Adam bears the weight of the fall. Again, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. Death entered the world and spread to all men as a result of Adam's sin. Now, again, Eve was the first one. But, and I was rereading this in Genesis, uh, preparing for this morning, and, and, and in Genesis 2.16, God warned Adam before Eve was even created. Uh, he promised this, he said in, in Genesis 2.16 and 17, and the Lord God commanded the man, 
saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in that day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Death will enter in. And at the moment that Adam sinned, the principle of death entered the world. Straight up. Uh, Yeah, was Eve the first one? Yes. As a matter of fact, in just reading the nuances of that, further on in Genesis 3, when, when the serpent tempts the woman, she recites back that, We're not to eat of this tree. We are not even to touch it. And I was just picturing Adam, because it never says that God told her that, so we have to assume that her husband did. (laughs) And that Adam said, don't eat of it. Don't even get near it. Don't touch it. Don't do it. You know, sort of that strong thing. Uh, Husbands, you guys understand what I mean. Anyway, why is that? It's because we're talking about headship. We're talking about headship over the human race, and we're going to look at that. We're going to look at what what the federal head of the human race is, but also that, and and I will teach a a complementarian view on husbands and wives. What what I mean by that is the Bible presents beautiful complementary roles for women and men, husbands and wives. Now, there's another view that's out there, and it's actually getting traction in churches, and that's called an egalitarian role. It's where we are absolutely equal in every way. The woman can be the pastor, and she, you know, has all of that. I don't believe that that's what God puts forth. I mean, we're told, Paul told Timothy, he said, you know, it's not right that a woman should teach a man or exercise authority over him. Why? Is it because of an equality issue? Absolutely not. Jesus is the first one in history that elevated women to equal status as men. However, there are roles, as we looked at when we were in the book of Ephesians, there are complementary roles. We complete each other in in the way that God has set it up. Now, as we're looking at headship here, it's a different kind of headship. We're going to look at the headship of these two men over the human race. They represent humanity. We understand that death is part of our existence, but it wasn't supposed to be that way. We struggle against it. We spend vast sums of time, (laughs) energy, and money trying to prolong life to escape death's inevitable grip. (laughs) I see people that are, I mean, they're just like everything. I knew a guy years ago that he had invested huge amounts of money in every supplement and everything. I'm not saying it's wrong, but it's like, It was just like everything was geared towards, I got to live as long as I possibly can. Because death outside of Christ is a fearful thing. A great deal of the anguish that we go through has to do with death. If you've ever stood with the empty shell of someone who has just died, you understand the anguish of grief, the agony that that produces in the human soul. If you've ever been at a memorial service and you see a family just devastated, you understand the effects of death. And we talk about you know, two things. Well, you know, we don't want to talk about death and taxes here. I can't tell you about taxes, but I can sure talk to you from God's word about death. And there are some huge things that Paul puts forth here that deal with it. Not just death, but about eternal life. All of this is a result of Adam's sin. We call it original sin. That uh, sin and death have been going on for so long that we, we sort of struggle with the thought that they don't need to be. Uh, I mean, we make the assumption that that's just the way it is. And it is in a hu- from a human standpoint. However, a huge part of the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross was to conquer death, to restore things. And that's exactly what Paul's driving at here in Romans 5. The point in this is, it, this is a critically important principle. Death is a result of sin. They are linked. You cannot unlink them. Wherever you see death, you can count on the fact that uh, the principle of sin is at work. 
perhaps not directly. I mean, there are sins that lead to death. I believe that. I believe God's word bears that out. I don't want to take the time to go down that road, but it's true. There are certain sins that are unto death. However, what he's talking about here, in the same way that Adam, the day that he ate of it, God said, you'll surely die. He didn't die that day. But it produced death. It produced physical death. It produced spiritual death. Uh, Something that's not readily observable the moment somebody sins. However, that principle is in place. Think about it. It, (laughs) If the principle of sin were not in the world, according to God's word, we wouldn't be subject to death. Do you ever think about that? It's just interesting. What he says in verse 12, he says, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. The point here is because death and sin are connected, we can know that all men are sinners. How? Why? Because we're all subject to death. (laughs) They're linked. When he says all sinned, he's speaking of the human race collectively. All right? Uh, He's not going to be talking about sins individual. He's talking about sin as a nature that humans inherit from Adam. We all sinned in Adam. When Adam sinned, we sinned. (laughs) You might be thinking, hold that, Pastor John, wait a minute. No, I think that when Adam sinned, Adam sinned, and that when I sin, I sin. How are you making this connection? I didn't sin when Adam sinned. Adam sinned when Adam sinned. The point in this is that you and I were in Adam when he sinned. We're all connected to Adam genetically and spiritually uh, in that way. Uh, so and you might wonder, well, well, how can we know this? How, how can you say that that's the truth? Because we're subject to sin and death. That's part of it. That's part of what Paul is getting at here. Uh, If you weren't subject to death, it would demonstrate that you're not under the power of sin. Do you understand the logic that he's... This is a very logical argument that he's putting forth here in verse 12. Uh, We are subject to both. We are born subject to death. From the moment that we came into existence, from the moment that you and I came into being, we became subject to death. So the question then arises, was it because I somehow sinned in the womb? (laughs) The Pharisees taught that. Uh, When Remember, they were with the guy and and they said, who sinned, he or his parents? And and they were assuming that sin began in the womb because they were were kind of tangled up. We'll look at the law of Moses and how that plays a part in this. Uh, But the point in all of this is this proves that Our essential sinfulness is inherited from Adam. Period. We are sinners because we inherit Adam's nature. We're born sinners and we're born subject to death. We're mortal because we're sinful. Otherwise, we would not die. The point is that Adam made each one of his descendants sinners. So in verse 12, he says, death spread to all men. He's talking about every human being, except one. Think about this too. Even a little baby is a sinner. And and I know, and I love cuddly little babies, and, and I'm not trying to be offensive, but... Take a bottle away from a little baby. What's going to happen? If they were bigger, you'd be in huge trouble. (laughs) And I know, I've been to the grocery store, and it's always somebody else's kids. (laughs) You you see the mom, and she's dragging, it it appears to be a lifeless body of a child. He's laying on the floor, and he's not moving a muscle. Or or he's just screaming at the top of his lungs, and, and you're thinking, let me out of this place. We're born sinners. We're born sinful. (laughs) Here's a thought. Do we need to teach children to behave badly? No, of course not. We need to teach them to behave well. Why? Because they're sinners. They are born sinful. So in Psalm 51.5, David, King David, in his beautiful psalm of repentance when Nathan the prophet came and busted him for 
having Uriah, Bathsheba's husband killed and all of that. He says, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Again, we were born sinners. Now, I also want you to understand something else here. And this is, it, it seems subtle, but it's important. Uh, if a baby dies, being born a sinner, does that mean that that baby automatically goes to hell? I don't think so. I'm going to give you three reasons here from God's word. Why? The first is that children come under the covering of their believing parents. In, in 1 Corinthians 7, 14, Paul says, he's talking about Wives that are with unbelieving husbands or husbands with unbelieving wives and children. He says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife. And the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but now they are holy. So what's implied in that, yes, there's personal responsibility if an unbelieving husband does need to come to faith. I mean, I'm not saying that. I'm not making a case for universal salvation. But I am making a case for the fact that children are under the covering of their parents. Uh, another thing is, is that in First Samuel, or 2 Samuel chapter 12, we see David dealing with the death of his baby. And, and, and God had told him that, he would, that it would cost him significantly and questioning him about that, his servants were questioning, and he, uh, he said, can I bring him back again? He said, I shall go to him, but he's not going to return to me. So we can understand that um, these things come to bear as we consider the question, do children go to heaven or not? Most importantly, though, and I think over even looking at these as on a level of importance over the things that we're looking at in the scripture is the character of God comes into play, that he is loving, he's merciful. Yes, he's just, but he'll always do what's right. None of us are going to get to heaven and say, hey, wait a minute, God, how come that person? And we might be surprised, don't get me wrong. We might be surprised by who's there. We might also be surprised by who's not. The point is, is that we serve a merciful and loving and just God. Understand this. When a child tragically dies and goes to heaven, who's not had a chance to choose Christ, they go because of the love of a merciful father in heaven. They do not go to heaven because they were innocent and sinless. Now understand that. I'm not, I'm not trying to diss on babies. I'm saying that it, it, as sons and daughters of guilty Adam, we were each born guilty as well. That's just part of our condition. That's the human condition. It's not because a, 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 a child somehow deserves heaven but because of the rich mercy of God that's been extended to them. Uh, in verses 13 and 14, Paul's going to start dealing with an objection, but just to, to cap that off, I understand that God is loving, God is merciful. He doesn't just say, oh, hey, you know, I bound myself to this formula that if a child dies, I believe that if they have not had an opportunity to choose Christ, that God will do the most loving thing and that we'll see them in heaven. The objection that Paul's dealing with here, he, he, he sort of does the, he puts up the argument from both sides. Uh, we've looked at that. He's used that writing style before here in Romans. In verses 13 and 14, he, he's talking about the Jewish believers who were struggling with their understanding of original sin. And they're going, well, wait a minute. I didn't sin in Adam. I sinned because I broke the law of God. I broke the law of Moses. And he's saying, not so fast. Verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there's no law. Nevertheless, sin reigned from Adam to Moses. Even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, 
who is a type of him who is to come. So here's the objection. I'm not a sinner because of Adam. I'm a sinner because I personally broke the law of God. And Paul's reminding them before the law was given at Mount Sinai, did people sin? Oh, yeah, they did. I mean, there is more than ample evidence from the time of Adam and his sin, his son, on through. And you look at the whole period of time from Adam to Moses, men still sinned. So he's saying, look, it's not about breaking the law of God. Your sin doesn't come from breaking the law of God. It comes from the nature of Adam. And that's his point in this. So how do we know? Because sin and death reigned from Adam to Moses. That's what he's saying. That's why he's saying it. He's addressing the objection that the people would have thought, well, isn't it the law that comes to bear? We'll get to that. That plays a part, but that's not why we're sinners, because we broke rules. We're sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We sin because that's our nature. (laughs) I've mentioned many times before, if we could take, uh, let's say I I showed up here at church with this this cool little device, and and we had a little cap that we could put on your head. It's got a bunch of electrodes sticking out of it. And they feed down to a machine that's hooked up to our projector there. And we could put the thoughts that that have gone through your brain, not for a lifetime, not for this week, but since you got out of bed this morning, If we projected that up on the screen for everybody to see, how comfortable would you be? Yeah. We sin because we're sinners. We sin because that's our nature. He's saying that sin and death were in the world even though people didn't sin in the same way as Adam. That's what he talks about here. The point... Uh, is that the law is too late to prevent sin and death, and it's too weak to save from sin and death. So what's the purpose of the law? We'll get to that. So now Paul sets up a series of contrasts between Adam's work and Jesus' work. This is the two men in verses 15 to 17. Uh, But before we get to this section, I want you to understand the principle that we were born under the representation of Adam. Adam represents humanity. All right? Uh, And you've got to understand that. You've got to understand that he is what we call the federal head. Now, when we look at, this is called the doctrine of federal headship, and you don't have to remember that, but think about our president. (laughs) Well, don't think too much. (laughs) Just kidding. But think about, all right, our president is the head of the federal government. If he declares, and he sends troops to go to a particular part of the world, and we go into a war, we don't say our president is at war. No, because he's the federal head. He's the one who, who represents us in the world. We say the, America is at war. We are at war. It's the same kind of principle that Paul is driving at here when he's talking about Adam. Adam is the head of the human race. He's the first man. We're going to talk about the second man here in a minute. Uh, obviously, we know that that's Christ. But you've got to understand that going in to these particular arguments that he's making. Uh, in verse 15, he says, But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift of the grace of the one, who, of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. The, the, and the word abounded means he just pours it on, just floods it out there. So now he's talking about the free gift as opposed to the offense. What's the free gift? We've been studying it here in Romans. Righteousness, right standing with God. How do we get it? By grace. It's the grace of God at work, granting us right standing before God through the blood of Christ. That's the gift. It's the gift of salvation. It's the gift of righteousness. It's the gift of right standing with with the Lord. And it's only received through God's grace as a gift. And I want you to note something here. He talks about the gift. Now, the gift is offered. The gift is given, right? Right? 
Uh, in order for it to become effective in one's life, the gift must be received. Did Jesus die for the sins of the world? Absolutely. Does everyone benefit? It's God's will, we're told in God's word, that, that, that all would come to repentance, that none would perish. But we know that not all will. We know that there is a diminishing number of people for a variety of factors. I mean, I, I read some of the, <laughs> and I get kind of discouraged. You read some of the things about uh, attendance at churches being in decline. Why? Because it's the last days. People are not paying as close attention to what we talked about at the beginning about understanding that our lives are defined through this, through the word of God. We don't define our lives. God defines our lives through his word. So the free gift is righteousness, right standing before God, and we obtain that by receiving his grace. So here's the contrast. In Adam, by the offense, sin, uh, of the one, many died. In Christ, the grace of God and the gift, righteousness, by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. Again, these two men are representatives of humanity. I'll get into that more in a minute. In verse 16, he says, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came through the, the, from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. What on earth is he talking about? Here's the contrast. In Adam, Adam's sin spread to all men, all mankind. As a result... We are all sinners by nature, and we stand condemned. But the good news, in Christ, the free gift, righteousness, comes through the many offenses which were laid on Jesus at the cross. The result? Justification. As we've talked about, just as if I'd never sinned, but much more than that. Not just right standing with God, but elevated standing with God. Not just declared sinless, but but now declared righteous, now declared <laughs> a son of God, a daughter of God with power. I was thinking about it this way. What he's talking about, what does he mean by, okay, by one man's sin, this, the death spread to all men, and, and then by one man through many offenses were justified. What he's saying here, I was looking at it, I was thinking about, like, say I had a bowl of marbles. My name's Adam. <laughs> and and in this bowl of marbles is humanity, each person. So I take that, I sin, and I, I dump this thing out, and there's marbles everywhere. Jesus comes through the offenses of many, because Adam sinned, there, many offend, many sin. And he says, I'm gathering all that up, and I'm taking that with me to the cross. So through the many offenses that Jesus died for, we're justified just as if we'd never sinned, just as if we went to the cross ourselves, but he went there in our place. He died in our place through the many offenses. If you look at redemptive history, again, looking at Adam, God creates Adam, creates Eve, gives him a wife, and Adam essentially says, Yahoo. I mean, that's a loose translation from the Hebrew. But... Um, <laughs> He was excited, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. <laughs> wow, you know, that's great. And, and things are going well. He says, look, I want you to name all the animals. I want you to name the plant. Yeah, this is yours, dominion. You have dominion over the earth, Adam. Good stuff. And it lasts about seven minutes before the fall. Virtually all of God's word from that moment forward is towards God's work of restoring man to fellowship with himself. Adam walked with God in the cool of the day. Adam had fellowship with God. That fellowship was broken. And now, through the second Adam, that's restored. It's put back. It's put right. And that's what Paul's getting at here. The result is justification. All of redemptive history from Adam's sin forward is towards God's work of bringing us into right relationship with him. Verse 17, 
For by the one man's uh, offense, death reigned through the one much more. We've looked at this is one of five. There are five much mores in Romans chapter five. Much more, those who received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. The point in this is that Jesus gives a free gift that also has consequences for the human race. We've looked at the consequences that Adam had over the human race, and here's the contrast. In Adam, by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, through Adam. Notice that death reigned. That's an interesting, interesting word. What it's talking about is dominion. What it's talking about, it's a, it's a, it's a kingly term. This is though, and and the, this word is used of kings in other parts of God's word. And it's talking about dominion. The king's domain is the king's dominion. It's what he has rule or reign over. When he talks about death reigning, he's talking about death having dominion over humanity, over every living person. In Christ, those who receive an abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Yeah, he is the one who rules over us. No longer Adam, if you have come to faith, if you believe. So in verses 18 and 19, he begins to do a summary of these two men. He says, therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. We've looked at that. Even so, through one man's righteous act, that's the cross, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. We're talking about life and death. We're talking about sin and righteousness. We don't make these terms up. These are clear terms. This is a weighty, weighty passage. And it gives us a very clear understanding of the effect of sin in, in our lives Sin bringing death. And he talks about also the work of Christ, the part of a central part of the work he did when he went to that cross was to give us life. He's called the firstborn of the resurrection. Verse 19, he says, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. There's the contrasts again. Both Adam and Christ here are seen as representatives of the human race. This is federal headship. This is what it means that Adam represents humanity and sin and death spread to all men. And now we're looking at Jesus representing humanity and the opportunity to come into, to step in from death into life. You want to talk about miracles. You know, we don't need to see, you know, pull a rabbit out of the hat to see a miracle. You look at the, the human soul. I look at people in this church who I have been beyond blessed to see them step from death to life. To see them step from darkness to light. This is the transaction. This is what that brings that all about. Death in Adam. Life in Christ. Adam, the head of the human race. Death, sin and death to all men. Jesus, the head of the human race, the second Adam, bringing life, bringing purpose, bringing meaning to our lives. So here's the contrast. In Adam, through the one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men. And he says, by one man's obedience, disobedience, many were made sinners. Why? Because Adam is the representative. He's the federal head of humanity. In Christ, through the, act of, the one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. By one man's obedience, Paul writes, many will be made righteous. Jesus is the second Adam. He is the federal head of humanity. In 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about it. He speaks of Jesus as the second Adam. Further contrasts the two there. I just want to spend a couple of minutes and read that. 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 49. He says, and so it is written in verse 45 of 1 Corinthians 15, the first man, Adam, became a living being. 
He's created. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. I love that. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. The first man was of the earth, made of dust. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As man was as was the, the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust, you and I. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. If you've been redeemed, if the blood of Christ is on your life, that's you and I. We are now heavenly beings. Do you ever think about when eternal life begins? It doesn't start when you die. It starts the moment that you receive Christ. It starts the moment that Jesus takes up residence by the Holy Spirit in your heart, in your life. That is when eternal life starts. You go from being mortal to being immortal because you want to know something, the second death can't touch you now. Oh, you may die, shed this body, and we will unless the Lord comes and we hear that trumpet and we're caught up with him in the air together with him. And yet eternal life starts the moment that our lives are identified not with the first Adam, but now re-identified with the second, with the spiritual man. He says, as, man, as was the man of dust, so also are those who are made of dust. And as the heavenly man, so also are those who are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the man of dust, sin and death, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. Righteousness. Life. Not just for this life, but life eternal. So in verses 20 and 21, as we wrap up this chapter, Paul touches on some important details. Now, next week we're going to begin chapter 6. Like I said, very much of this, a lot of this is setting up what he wants to teach us in chapter 6. That's why there's a chapter break here. It's one of the places where I actually agree with the chapter break. A lot of times I think, well, that's a kind of a weird place to put it because it interrupts the context. But anyway, enough of that. But the point is, is that he's going to greatly expand on some of these things in chapter 6. However, when he gets into verses 20 and 21, I want to look at a, a couple of things there in closing because they directly, and I'll start next week's, verse, uh, next week's study with verses 20 and 21. That's where we'll begin from because it, again, it dictates the context uh, of what lies ahead. He says in verse 20, moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. That's interesting. Have you ever thought about that? That the offense might abound. That the, the law entered. What, the, what does the law do? The law, yeah, it shuts man up under sin. The law defines sin. We've looked at that as we've looked at, remember we looked at the, the speed limit sign. The solution to not breaking the law is not you take down the speed limit sign. <laughs> That's crazy. People are going to have a lot of accidents. The solution is understanding that that law is there to remind us that we sin. So the offense abounds under the law. That's his point. We already know that we were speeding through life long before we saw the sign. However, now that we see the sign, it defines sin. But I love this. In the second half of verse 20, it says, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Now, the word abounded much more is one word in the original language. And what it means is it super abounded. Folks, according to verse 20, it is not humanly possible. Now having your life identified with Christ, the second Adam, no longer identified with Adam, sin and death, it is not possible to out-sin the grace of God. Can't happen. If you truly belong to him, do you carry guilt, shame, regret? We all do in different ways, in different measures. Some of us a lot. Brothers and sisters, take this verse to heart. Where sin abounds, grace superabounds. abounds. 
In other words, it is so, the grace of God is so much bigger than your sin, than my sin. It is so much bigger than my guilt or my shame. It is so much more effective than anything I could have ever done against God as a sinner. Excuse me. This is where sin abounds. Grace superabounds. Much more. Verse 21, so that as sin reigned in death, even so grace might reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Praise God. Through Jesus, grace reigns. If you belong to him, you are under his dominion. You are part of his kingdom. And it is a kingdom that is driven by his grace, unmerited favor. I love you because I choose to love you. Not because you're all that lovable. But that's the nature of grace. He loves us because of who he is, not because of who we are. We're under the reign of grace. We're not under the reign of sin any longer. If you're engaged in in an aspect of life-dominating sin, I've got a couple of words for you. Stop it. Turn from it. You dishonor God with it. You're not under the reign of it. You don't have to sin. The power of sin has been broken in your life. That's part of the work that Jesus accomplished at the cross was to break the power of sin, to break the power of death. That's why he resurrected. It's the only reason he could resurrect because he lived a sinless life. Death couldn't hold him. These two are linked together and they will always be linked together because it's part of our condition. But when you come to Christ, you get a new nature. You're now identified with the heavenly man, not with the man of dust, as he says in 1 Corinthians. The reign of sin, the reign of death is broken in our lives. Can we still sin? Yeah, we can. It's not God's will. Understand we're... (laughs) We blow it. And his point in verse 20 is you can't out-sin that. God's grace is so much greater than anything that we could do to mess things up. As I mentioned, the reign here is likened to the reign of a king. It's the dominion. We're under the dominion of righteousness and grace. We're no longer under the dominion of sin and death. We have a new federal head. We have a new representative. His name is Jesus, went to the cross atoned for sin, went in our place that we would not experience death. And I'm talking about spiritual death. Uh, Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says, and you were dead in your trespasses, sins. And then I love those words. He says, but God, being rich in the mercy that he has saved us. By grace, you've been saved through faith. Not as a result of works, not as a result of anything you did, but because he's gracious and he's loving and he's kind and he's generous and he pursues a relationship with us. That's the God that we serve. If you don't know the Lord this morning, perhaps you're catching this online or uh, even here, or, or you've been struggling, perhaps you've been going backwards. There's grace for that. The Bible tells us that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble, to those who are willing to say, you know what, I've been walking away from you, God. Whether you have identified your life with him and you're walking away, God's working in your heart, he's convicting you of areas of sin, or you have not ever come to him and had that transaction for the first time, Humble out. Admit that you're a sinner. That's a pretty large club. 
You don't have to be captivated. You don't have to have sin reigning in your life. You can give your life to Jesus. And it, it would be a simple prayer that's something like, God, I've been walking away from you. I, I realize I've been in rebellion towards you. And I don't want that to be the case. I ask you to forgive me for my sins. To cleanse me. And give me a new life. Give me this life. Give me the life of the heavenly man. Give me the life that you have for those who by faith identify with you, identify with the cross. I guarantee you he will do it. He'll forgive you. He'll fill you with his Holy Spirit. And you don't have to work at changing yourself. All of a sudden, things will start to shift. Things will start to, to be different. And, and that's part of the work that he does. He doesn't say, wait till you get your act together. You're never going to have your act together. You are sinful because you're an Adam. He says, come to me. Let me give you rest. Let me cleanse you. Let me wash you. Let me give you life. That's the gospel. That's the God that we serve. That's the one that we come here to worship and that we come here to learn about. He's good and merciful and gracious.